Turmoil in the sprint car world is nothing new, and today we'll dive into the two attempts to overthrow the World of Outlaws reign as the top national series. Let's go. It's Tuesday, January 24th. I'm Justin Fiedler. This is Dirt Tracker Daily. We spent a lot of time the last few months talking about high limit and who's going outlaw racing, person bonus money, true outlaw schedules, and all of the unrest currently in the sprint car world. Because of that, I ended up down some rabbit holes yesterday, and I wanted to do my show today on the two big times in the past where groups attempted to split off from the World of Outlaws Sprint Car Series. High Limit is not a split, which Brad Sweet has tried to make clear uh, on numerous occasions, but it has caused some indigestion, maybe, uh, for teams, tracks, and series around the country. World Racing Group and Brian Carter are not the only ones not thrilled about this new venture, and I've actually heard from a few parties directly about their thoughts and feelings against it. This type of unrest, though, is not new to sprint car racing, and the World of Outlaws were under threat twice in their past history, the first in 1989 and the second in 2005. In both instances, a large group of top-name drivers went elsewhere, but eventually ended up back as Outlaws when those two series went under. And I'm sure some in my audience probably remember these two situations, but if you don't or you want to hear about it again, come along with me for a little bit of a history lesson. The first attempt to knock the World of Outlaws off the Sprint Car Series throne started late in 1988. An accountant from Des Moines, Iowa named Larry Clark formed the United Sprint Association, and the new series ran three events late in that year at Manzanita, Memphis, and Devil's Bowl. Mark Kinzer won the Manzanita show, Dave Blaney at Memphis, and Doug Wolfgang at Devil's Bowl, with Steve Kinzer being crowned the mini series champion, even though he didn't have a victory. For 1989, the new USA series offered up equity to several big names and attracted Steve and Carl Kinzer, Mark Kinzer, Sammy Swindell, and Dave Blaney away from the Outlaws. According to series PR guy Gary Guler, USA's plan was to offer up a more condensed schedule that required far less travel. They would involve teams more in the rulemaking process and expand sprint car racing with more corporate sponsorships. This was all from an article in the Oklahoma newspaper from January of 1989. They ended up running about 50 races that year with stops at places like East Alabama, Devil's Bowl, Lawton, Manzanita, Sharon, Sealands Grove, Jackson, even Knoxville, Atomic, and Attica. Steve Kinzer was crowned the champion that season with 14 wins in 50 races. Uh, he topped Sammy and Mark Kinzer. Doug Wolfgang won the most races with 15, but only ran 28 USA races. He had a 20 outlaw wins that year as well and had something like 43 total victories before 1989 was over. Bobby Davis Jr. took the World of Outlaws championship that season with Steve, Sammy, Mark, and Blaney all the way, driving the famous Casey Luna 10 car. Steve only made 11 outlaw appearances in 1989 with a single win at Hobstadt on May 14th. Even with the big names, uh, dates at marquee racetracks, and a lot of talk, USA disappeared after that first season, and all those teams returned to the outlaws for 1990. A couple of interesting notes here kind of around the USA series. First, the Brad Doty Classic was initially a USA event started in 1989. Now it's obviously part of the outlaw schedule. Also, Ted Johnson was so upset with Manzanita promoter Keith Hall over the USA deal that it was several seasons before the outlaws scheduled a date again at the Arizona racetrack. And I'll link to it below. It's actually what's on the screen here right now. Knoxville Raceway had a fun three-way match race between Steve, Sammy, and Wolfgang on July 4th, 1989 as part of the USA event that night. There's a video of it on the Knoxville YouTube channel, which I said I'll link to. You can also find most of the USA Series race results over at thethirdturn.com if you're curious. The second attempt to create a national touring sprint car series to challenge the World of Outlaws started in 2005. Towards the end of 2003, the World of Outlaws had been sold to Paul Kruger and Boundless Motorsports, and it wasn't long before the drivers and teams grew restless under the new ownership. There was growing dissent about how things were being managed, and drivers and teams were upset about things like the dwindling TV package. And in September that year, the Richard Petty Driving Experience announced it was starting the National Sprint Car League for 2006, and it had signed 12 current outlaw drivers and teams to three-year agreements to compete with them instead of the outlaws. And that list included Steve Kinzer, Jason Myers, Danny Lasoski, Joey Saldana, and others. In the series announcement, Kyle Petty said that the family had looked at acquiring the outlaws a few years before, but now had decided to start their own series. On top of the outlaw drivers they'd attracted, they'd also mentioned support from NASCAR guys like Tony Stewart, Ken Schrader, Dave Blaney, and Casey Kane. Late in 2005, though, things went sideways for the uh, new Petty-owned series, and Fred Brownfield, who uh, owned Gray's Harbor Raceway in Washington, stepped in to save the new series. 
He renamed it the National Sprint Tour and in just a few weeks put together the full season, announcing the 36 race schedule at the Chili Bowl on January 12th. The new series had races scheduled for tracks like Tulare, Dodge City, Lincoln Park, River City, Sealands Grove, Fonda, and many others. And with so many uh, big names moving over to the NST for 2006, the outlaw season that year was wide open. And it became the first real breakout year for Donnie Schatz. He won 19 times that year and his first outlaw title over Craig Delansky and Joey Saldana. The pivotal moment for the NST's future existence happened, though, on June 16, 2006, when Brownfield was killed in an accident at Grace Harbor. He was on the track helping line up Modifieds for their feature that night when he was struck by one of the cars. A few weeks later, the NST's assets uh, were sold to a group of team owners with the series, including Don Lamberti, Lonnie Parsons, Guy Stockbridge, and Steve Kinzer. The new ownership was able to finish the season with Danny Lasoski winning the title over Steve Kinzer and Tim Kading, but the series started to fade late in the year. Drivers like Lasoski and Kinzer decided to return to the Outlaws for 2007, with that series having a new TV deal worked out between Speed Channel and ESPN2. The NST folded in that offseason. And the 2006 year ended up being pivotal for the future of the World of Outlaws as well, as Tom Deary was brought in early that season and eventually took over as CEO when Paul Kruger resigned from Dirt Motorsports. And Dirt eventually became World Racing Group, which has evolved into the uh, organization that we know today. There's a lot of feeling out there that if Fred Brownfield hadn't died, that maybe the NST would have had a chance, especially with all of the turmoil happening inside Dirt Motorsports with Kruger, but now we'll never know. So those are the two times the World of Outlaws have come under threat from other series in its history. You'll notice a lot of similarities from these two instances to things happening right now. Clashes with ownership, divides over money, TV, the schedule. It shows that the more things change, the more they stay the same. The schedule, purse money, promotion was a problem then, and some view it as a problem now. Thanks for coming along to my uh, Sprint Car History class for today. All right, moving on. Competitors this season with the Flow Racing Night in America series will be racing for a bit more cash at season's end with a bump to the points fund. $27,000 has been pumped into the system with a champion earning $75,000 with perfect attendance or $50,000 without. Last year, I believe it was $30,000. Second and third also get more money while the payouts remain the same for fourth through tenth. There are 13 races on the 2023 slate for this midweek late model series with the series continuing or uh, counting a driver's 10 best performances for the season. Uh, that season starts on April 18th at Eldora. And we had a big championship shakeup last night at Weed Sport for the iRacing World of Outlaws Sprint Cars. Timothy Smith was just two points back of Alex Bergeron entering the night, but Smith missed a feature transfer in his heat and then didn't run well enough in the B main to make the Knights A, so he was on the sideline come feature time. Afterwards, that's dropped him all the way to third in the standings with one race to go and basically ended his chances at the title. Bergeron had to feed Tanner Pettit a right rear on the final lap of his heat to get a feature transfer, but he flipped in the main event and finished 14th. Tyler Shell is now second in the standings. He's 23 points back after a seventh place run last night. He does have an outside shot at the championship, but he'll probably need Bergeron to have issues in the finale. Bryce Lucius, who's actually a sprint car driver in real life, he ran 305s in Ohio in 2022 and is also planning a 410 schedule this season, was on the pole of last night's main event. He and Hayden Cardwell, though, tangled while battling for the lead and both ended up out of the race. That crash handed the lead to Swindell Speed Lab's James Edens. But his car faded late and Dylan Yeager ended up grabbing the victory. It was Yeager's first ever with the series and he joins a very short list of drivers who have won with both the iRacing World of Outlaws sprint cars and late models. Edens and Tyler Ducharme completed last night's podium. So just one race remaining now next Monday night at Charlotte to decide the $10,000 championship. That is 10,000 real dollars. Uh, you can watch the finale free at 9 p.m. Eastern on Dervision and on YouTube. There are three shows on the streaming schedule for this Tuesday. Clay-Per-View has the President's Cup from Avalon Raceway, which will certainly feature some American drivers. It's a big week down there, uh, down under with the Classic coming up. There's also Flow Racing 24-7 and Dirt Vision now. To see the full daily streaming schedule with links to watch, visit dirttracker.com slash watch tonight. All right, that's it for the show today. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll be right back here tomorrow for more Dirt Tracker Daily.